the electorate actually looks at candidates in a very holistic way. They ask which of these candidates has the independence, the proven ability and experience, and the ideas that will actually serve our nation and move us forward. There has not been someone inhabit the White House who is in full-time military, who truly understands the military and America's role around the world since John F. Kennedy. And in light of the global terror that has enveloped the world in the last decade or so, whomever gets the gig needs to have a solid handle on when and how to drop that military hammer. That includes being the person who has the nuclear codes handy. So think about it. Who scares you the most at the mere thought of having their finger on the button in a very shaky world? Our guest was the 14th chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff. He was there when the Twin Towers fell. No one knows the answers to these questions and more than our guest, also author of Without Hesitation, The Odyssey of an American General, General Hugh Shelton. General, thank you so much for joining us this evening. Thank you very much, Ed. It's a pleasure to be with you. General, that's a question that really hasn't been talked about much. Whoever becomes the new president will be the person who will have the nuclear codes sitting right in their hands. Who scares you the most about the possibility of being the person to make that decision? Well, I'll tell you the truth, Ed. At this, at this particular point, I'm not too worried about it at all because we've got a long way to go. Uh, things will sort themselves out, and the things that will scare me will be the same things, I think, that will scare the American electorate. Uh, I look for a person of character, and certainly there are some in this race that I think have, have got great character. Uh, but I also look for those that uh, I would not trust to have their finger on it, and that, uh, and there are a few of those in the race as well. So uh, over this next few months, we'll all have a chance to hear them express their views. Uh, I think all of us will get a feeling for who we want to have in there and who we don't. Now, one person I don't want to have their finger on the trigger is the one I'm most scared about, and that's in Iran. And that's the Ayatollah or the Supreme Leader or whoever they, they have appointed to be carried, walking around with that trigger. And that, uh, that certainly is a great concern in terms of today's topic. Let's talk about this a little bit. Donald Trump was on Meet the Press this weekend. He said that the deal made with Iran is going to lead us down a very deadly road. Here's what he said. They are going to be such a wealthy, such a powerful nation. They are going to have nuclear weapons. They are going to take over parts of the world that you wouldn't believe. And I think it's going to lead to nuclear holocaust. General, you wrote an op-ed entitled Don't Empower Iran's Tyrants. And one thing that caught my eye immediately was where you said the most important voices the administration, the administration rather, chose to sideline are of the Iranian people. Now, we're told by many people that the Iranian people themselves are actually in favor of this. But then again, there's a truth factor here about who those people are and what they really are able to say out loud as they are kept down by the mullahs day to day, yes? Well, you put your finger right on top of it, Ed. That's exactly what the problem is. And when you look at the, the 100,000 Iranians that are resistance uh, dis dissidents that met in Paris last month or in June, we, uh, you saw there a group that is scared to death that the Ayatollahs and that crew are going to get a nuclear deal and therefore have what some estimate to be $150 billion at their disposal to it to further uh, carry their extremism, their, their uh, terrorism throughout, spread it throughout the Middle East, and to buy weapons and to continue to suppress the 75 million Iranians that are under their direct control. You know, it's awfully tough to speak out against a regime who's armed, who has all the arms and who is constantly throwing those in jail that, that speak out against it. So, you know, you only get a half-truth when you talk about what's coming out of the Iranians at best. General, also in the op-ed, you said the only long-term solution to Iran's nuclear aspirations is a totally new system of governance based on democracy and secularism. But can you get that without putting American or allied boots on the ground and forcing it down their throats? Well, I certainly think there is another alternative that we ought to be examining, and that would be what the support of the resistance that currently exists the leadership and, for example, the NCRI, the National Council for the Resistance Against the Iranians, uh, that is led by Madame Rajavi, who has a program that looks like our Declaration of Independence. It is a, uh, it has all the rights, all the freedoms expressed in it for the Iranian people that you and I as Americans would like to see in, in our Constitution as well. And so giving them a chance by supporting them in a way that will allow them to empower the people inside of Iran and lead to an uprising 
which scares the daylights out of the, the mullahs and the ayatollahs inside of Iran. That's why they, are, they will imprison anyone that's associated with this group in any way, shape, or form. Uh, but we've got to support them if we want them to be able to move forward. General, let's seek to cut through all what usually happens inside the Bellway and a lot of the political rhetoric here right now. In your opinion, bluntly speaking, why doesn't the President of the United States listen to you, other military members and other people who know the Iranians, have known them for decades, and know exactly what's going on on the ground. Why is he ignoring you? Ed, it is beyond me. I, when you look at the group that's speaking out against it, it is one of the most bipartisan groups that you, you'll probably ever find inside of the Beltway. It's got everyone from former, vice pre, uh, pre, uh, from former presidential candidate and head of the Democratic National Committee, Howard Dean, to uh, Governor uh, Ed, uh, Ed Rendell, Governor Tom Ridge, who was also the uh, first Homeland Security Director. And then it's the Attorney General, Director of the FBI, two CIA chiefs, former Army former NSA, former commandant, the people of just unimpeachable integrity that are saying, look, Mr. President, we know you don't want to go to war with Iran. We understand that. We know that you don't want, really want a, a nuclear-empowered Iran, but there is another alternative. Listen to what we're saying. This deal that you're about to sign is not going to get that for the American people. It is going to empower the current Iranians that are spreading their form of terrorism throughout the Middle East as we speak. It will empower them to buy weapons from Russia, from China, et cetera. And the real winners in all of this are going to be the Shia militia that's being supported by Iran through the Middle East. That, uh, you, you look, find them along with ISIS. And, and that's what's happening, and it will happen at an increased pace when we sign this agreement. General, let me spin from Iran to Iraq a moment here. Colonel Derek Harvey has been a guest many times on the show. He's a former intel officer, and he recently said that it is President Obama and Hillary Clinton, not Bush, not Jeb Bush, not a Bush, responsible for Iraq today. Do you agree or disagree? Well, I would have to disagree to a point. I mean, I told President Bush when I was his, his uh, pr principal military advisor that we should not invade Iraq, and I felt very strongly about that. We had neutered Saddam Hussein. I mean, he had nothing left. Every time that he fired a missile, and he never hit anything, but every time he fired, we took more and more away from him, and we did that by design. So he was getting weaker and weaker. There was no al-Qaeda presence in Iraq at the time, and so— why we elected to go into that is still beyond me, but we can see what the outcome of it was. And uh, I still believe that that was, the, that was the first mistake. And then, of course, it has it is continued to get worse and worse over the years. General, I only have about 10 seconds left. I'm going to circle around right to the back. Who do you think you would trust with those nuclear codes running for president today? You know, I'll be very candid with you, Ed. There's so many here right now, I haven't even decided which Republican <laughs> candidate I like the best. And, you know, I, I don't vote Democratic or Republican. I vote for the best person, per, of an individual of character and someone that I think is best qualified to lead the nation. And I can't sort it out yet for either party. We will be in touch, though, and make sure that we can down the road. Reminder once again, your book is called Without Hesitation, The Odyssey of an American Warrior. General Hugh Shelton, thank you so much for being with us. We certainly appreciate your time. Thank you, Ed. My pleasure. All right. Let's remind everybody, too, we've talked about Donald Trump here. Don't forget that cap that Donald Trump has been wearing, the Make America Great Again cap. You can have your own. This is not an endorsement of Donald Trump or his campaign, but it's a chance for you to show that you're part of the Trump army. Call or go online, 800-485-4350, or go to Newsmax.com forward slash Trump cap to get yours. And the fastest 60 Minutes in News continues.